Well, good morning to everybody, and we'll begin our worship with the ringing of the church bell. Welcome everyone to our September 13th worship service, those here and uh, those at home. Um, again, if you are worshiping with us at home, we're on a bit of a delay on Facebook, so if you would like to uh, wish everyone here in the church um, peace be with you, go ahead and type your names now and uh, peace be with you, and, uh, share, and we'll share that during the passing of the peace. Want to share uh, some announcements? Today is Stew Bear Sunday, so it's uh, Dress Down Day at Lost Creek and Wear a Hat and Church Day at McCoysville. Uh, this quarter, Stew Bear is collecting for the Crop Walk. Uh, the Crop Walk will be October 11th. The registration time has moved from 12.30 to 1.30, and the walk will start at 2 o'clock. You can either walk with us in person at the uh, Walker Township Park, or you can um, join us uh, on Facebook Live. Today, uh, after worship at McCoysville, we'll have a session meeting. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be having our salad bar this fall. Uh, next Sunday is our special offering Sunday. Uh, at Lost Creek, we take up our joyful noise offering for the emergency heating fund. Uh, at McCoysville, we collect a Meals and Wheels offering. Coming up on Sunday, September 27th at 4 o'clock, we will have a cookout at Ritzman Ridge, and uh, it's going to be covered dish. We ask everyone to wear a mask when they first arrive, but once we get our food and settle, settle down, uh, we can take off our masks and enjoy the uh, food and the, the conversation. Uh, but to make it a little fun, uh, I'm going to come up with some uh, awards for different types of masks. Uh, perhaps for one who, somebody who's wearing a mask that's color coordinated with their clothes, or uh, the Lady Gaga Award for the most bizarre mask that you can wear, you know, things like that. So come on out and join us. Uh, let us know if you're coming. Trustees have a meeting coming up October 1st. Uh, starting in October on Wednesdays, uh, we will have a six week book study called Scrappy Church God's Not Done Yet. And it's a, a book about small membership churches that uh, had been in decline, but now are seeing uh, regrowth and revitalization. And there are three things that this book has identified in all of those churches that make them scrappy churches or churches that come back. And uh, we're going to examine that, see how we do it here at Lost Creek already and, and at McCoysville and how we could do it better. Uh, the books are $5, and they're small, so if you would like one, please let me know. At Lost Creek, we are collecting hand lotion for the nursing homes and paper towels for the food pantry. And, of course, you can always get wise gift cards from Tom Heckman, and 5% of the value of those cards goes to our discretionary fund. Are there any other announcements? Then uh, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship God as we listen to our meditation music.
lovely job as always, Patty. Thank you. You're welcome. The scripture focus for our worship today comes from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents, that's um, roughly 150,000 days' wages, uh, was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and a payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, about a hundred days' wages. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Lord always blesses the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Thank you, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you have had mercy on us and have forgiven us through your Son. Make us more like him, so that we too forgive one another from the heart. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we want to wish uh, everyone peace. Oh, we forgot to light the candle. We need to light the candle. Let's light the candle first. Thank you. The true light which enlightens everyone has come into the world. To all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gives the power to become children of God. That's our peace right there. All right, so we're going to say peace be with you. So peace be with you and also with you. So go ahead and wish one another peace. Peace be. Well, that's, this is peace and then be with you. Yeah. Hey, Ellie. Peace be with you. <laughs> yep. And then you then you say, and also with you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Make sure I'm up to date here. So uh, Cheryl and Tessa say uh, peace be with you, and Dana and Noreen Thomas, and Kim, and uh, let's see, I said Tessa, and Reese, and Hazel, and Rose, and a few others, so uh, peace be with all of you at home, and they they wish peace to all of you. So let's um, meditate on uh, the words to uh, a hymn, the tune is vaguely familiar to us, uh, but uh, the hymn words, I think, are new to us. God, how can we forgive?
So last week, uh, we were looking at Matthew chapter 18. This is a uh, chapter where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples, and he knows that he is going to be arrested and crucified, and though he will rise again, he will uh, ultimately go to heaven to be uh, in his heavenly kingdom, and so the disciples will be left alone. And he needs to give them instructions on how to be disciples. And so we remember last week he talked about uh, taking a little child into the midst of the disciples and saying we have to become like one of the least of these and humble ourselves and serve others if we want to be in the kingdom of heaven and if we want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. And he talked, uh, last week we looked at him talking about how when somebody wrongs us, we need to work hard at repairing that wrong, at repairing the scars that are caused by that wrong, uh, and never giving up on repairing the scars that are, that are caused in a, in a uh, church community and in our personal relationships. So in our scripture lesson this morning, Peter comes along with the obvious question, how often do I have to keep forgiving somebody? What if there's somebody in my church or my community who I just cannot see eye to eye with, and we are always uh, irritating one another and offending one another? How often do I have to keep forgiving them? And Peter seems like he's being generous here. He, he says, do I forgive them seven times? In the Bible, uh, there was this uh, three strikes, you're out rule. Uh, it applies to a lot of different things in the Bible. Uh, including forgiveness. You were encouraged to forgive people as many as three times, but if they kept offending after that, then you could uh, write them off. You didn't have to uh, deal with them anymore. Uh, so Peter, by saying seven times, well, that's two times as many plus one. And of course, seven is a holy number, so it seems like he's being very generous. And yet Jesus responds not seven times, but, and this is one of those uh, verses in the Bible that different translations translate different ways. He says either 70 times seven or 77 times. And in this case, it's just a matter of translation. Uh, the literal Greek translation looks like it would be 70 times seven, uh, but it could also be read as 70 times plus seven. Uh, and 70 times 7 really makes the point Jesus is trying to make, doesn't it? Because that's 490 times. You're going to lose count how many times a person has wronged you before you get to 490 times. But the 77, uh, a lot of uh, translations uh, use because it points to a story in the Old Testament. I'm sure you all remember the story of Lamech, right? Yep, uh-huh. I see a lot of heads nodding. Uh, <laughs> Lamech was a descendant of Cain. In Genesis chapter 4, the chapter begins with Cain killing his brother Abel. And remember, God says, because you've killed your brother out of jealousy, uh, you will no longer be able to work until the ground. You can no longer be a farmer. You're going to become a wanderer. And Cain is afraid that if he wanders upon somebody, they're going to know that he killed Abel and they will kill him uh, in revenge. And so God puts the mark, whatever it was, on Cain and, and gives the warning that if anybody tries to get revenge and kill Cain, they will experience uh, revenge sevenfold. So it's a warning to leave Cain alone. Well, several generations later, Lamech comes along. Lamech has two wives. And uh, one day he comes home to his wives and he says, A man struck me today and I killed him. And if, uh, Abel, if uh, Cain was to be avenged seven times, then I should be avenged 77 times. In other words, if Cain was protected by God because he killed out of jealousy then I, who was struck by another man, had every right to kill the other man in defense, and anyone who would try to get revenge on me, they will uh, ex experience vengeance 77 times. And sadly, this is one of those stories in the Bible that shows us how quickly 
the world descends into sin and violence and uh, corruption. One uh, hurtful act is revenged by another hurtful act, is revenged by another hurtful act, and it just goes on and on and on. That's the way of the world we live in because of sin. And Jesus, in saying not seven times, but 77 times, is pointing us back to that story and how the kingdom of the world is, and then says the kingdom of heaven is different. The kingdom of heaven is the opposite. Instead of responding to hurts by hurting even more, we are to respond with forgiveness. And to keep on forgiving. Don't repay evil with evil. And then he tells us this parable. There's a king. He calls in his slaves to go over the books, and he finds out this one slave owes him a horrendous debt. Uh, the, it's kind of hard to know exactly how much it is, but it works out to roughly 150,000 days wages for the average, uh, average slave. Imagine that, 150,000 days worth of wages. And, of course, the, the slave can't repay that much money. And so the king decides to sell him, his wife, his children, and all of his possessions and get back what little bit he can. And, of course, the slave falls on his knees and pleads for more time. Does he even have 150,000 days' worth of life left to recoup all those losses? And the king, amazingly, doesn't give him more time he completely forgives him. He wipes the debts off the books. Now, there's different um, ideas spread around for why this slave would owe so much. It's possible that he was a money manager for the king and that he had made out loans to other people, totaling 150,000 days late, uh, wages, and had failed to collect on those loans. So he was a bad money manager. Or perhaps he was the tax collector for the king. We do know that in, in that culture, the tax collectors were said, were told, collect this much amount of money. And they would go out and they would collect it, plus a little on the side for themselves. And they would, that would be a debt that they owed until they paid it back to the, to the government. So maybe that's how he ended up with such an enormous debt. Maybe he was a poor tax collector. Or maybe this is one of those stories where the king was just kept loaning and loaning and loaning him money and his debt continued to grow and grow and grow until he got to this place. The point is, he has this massive debt he has to repay and the king is suddenly very generous. He takes pity on the man and he forgives him all of that debt, wipes it off the books. Then the man leaves. And as he's walking along, he comes across a fellow uh, slave, another servant of the king. And this man owes him a hundred days' wages, a paltry sum to what he was forgiven. But instead of forgiving him, he throws the man in prison until he can work off the debt. He holds that debt over him. This... Uh, Wicked slave is now brought back into the presence of the king. And the king says, I forgave you all of that debt. You should have forgiven the other debt. You will be tortured until you repay it. And of course, there's no way he can repay it. In, in other words, the uh, king is going to torture him for the rest of his life. And Jesus says, God will do the same to us if we do not forgive others from our hearts. Now, it's important to note one of the things in this story is that this king was suddenly being very generous and being very kind and very forgiving. Yes, the servant should have felt the joy from that, uh, from that forgiveness and then extended it to other people. But there was something else going on here. The king 
wanted him to follow his example. Wanted the slave to follow his example. He was being magnanimous. He wanted everybody to be able to see it. And so he wanted to inspire this into the, in the hearts of other people so that they would be magnanimous and that they would go out and they would forgive everyone. Sounds like he, maybe he was trying a new tactic in his, uh, in his ruling of the kingdom. But because the slave refuses to follow the example set by the king, the king gets blustery and angry and instead decides to torture him rather than sell him off and get his money back. Jesus is calling on us to follow the example set by our king in the kingdom of heaven, to, be, to follow the example set by God. It's important to note that this is a parable. It's not an allegory. There are not exact matches between every item in the story and in, in, in real life. The king is a human king. He has human feelings. He can uh, be uh, angry one minute and happy the next. He's not God. The king is not God. It's that setting the example and following it that Jesus is pointing us to. And God is righteous. We've talked about what righteousness means. It means upholding your end of a covenant agreement. And even though we break our covenant agreement with God over and over again by denying him the lordship in our lives and trusting his, his laws and obeying them in our lives, God is righteous because he maintains our, his covenant relationship with us despite the fact that we break it. He has every right to say, you broke the covenant first, it's done. But instead, God maintains that covenant relationship with us. He continues to be our God. He continues to love us and to care for us and to guide us. And this is something we see throughout the Bible. Even when God has to discipline his people, he does not abandon them. He forgives them and he brings them back. And, of course, the ultimate example of that is in his sending his son, Jesus Christ. God knew that we could not set ourselves free from the power of sin. And so God sent his son, Jesus, into the world to die for our sins. And through our faith in his death and resurrection, we are set free from sin. We are able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We are able to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. And God has set this example for us. And if we want to live in the kingdom of heaven, then we have to follow that example in our own lives. Now that last verse sounds really harsh. God will do the same to you if you don't forgive another person from your heart. And it makes it sound like God's going to throw us into some torture pit for the rest of our existence if we don't forgive others. But remember, this is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. How do you live in the kingdom of heaven? Seeking revenge against somebody for a wrong that they did to you is not living in the kingdom of heaven. It's living in the kingdom of this world. Remember Lamech. So if we refuse to forgive another person, and we hold on to grudges, and we seek to get revenge against them, then we are not living in the kingdom of heaven. We're living in the kingdom of the world. And therefore, we are not enjoying the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. We are torturing ourselves. Corey Ten Boom uh, lived in Holland during uh, World War II, and when Holland was overrun by the Germans, uh, she and her family were arrested and thrown into a concentration camp at uh, Ravensbrück uh, because they had tried to protect and, uh, and hide Jews. Uh, after the war, she, she lived through it. Her sister Betsy did not. But she was able to live through this experience of the, um, of the concentration camps. And after the war, she went back to Holland and she opened up a home for people who had uh, suffered at the hands of the, of the Germans. 
And she discovered something. She discovered that those who would forgive the former enemies were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives. Those who nursed their wounds and their bitterness remained invalids. They were never able to get back to an ordinary life again. So she worked with people in Holland to help them learn how to learn God's love and to learn how to forgive and how to set themselves free from the pain that they had experienced. Well, eventually she went back to Germany and she started sharing the message of God's forgiveness with the people of Germany. And she said that one day she was in Munich and she was giving her, her message. And it was the same way everywhere she went. After the message people would quietly stand up and walk out like they were having a hard time believing that God could forgive them and that they could experience forgiveness. But there, uh, in Munich, there was this man walking toward her. He was a, he was a little pudgy, bald-headed, but she recognized him. And as, as he walked toward her, she could envision him in that Nazi military uniform because he was one of the guards at Ravensbrück. And she was sure he didn't recognize her, but she recognized him. And suddenly all those feelings from Ravensbrück came back to her. She remembered uh, how embarrassing it was when they had to throw their clothes in a pile in the middle of the room and walk naked past the guards. And she remembered all the torments that they experienced while they were in Ravensbrück. And the man came up to her, and he said, a fine message, Fräulein, how good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And he reached out his hand and he asked her to forgive him. And suddenly it became real for her. And she couldn't do it. She could not uh, force herself to forgive this man. And so she fumbled in her purse and she knew, you know, God has forgiven me over and over again. I need to forgive this man. I need to set myself free. And finally, even though she didn't feel it in her heart, she uh, found the will to reach out her hand and to say the words, I forgive you. And suddenly warmth and joy flooded over her. And she was able to re be released from the pain that she was carrying. And she was able to release him from the pain that he was carrying. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says we need to forgive others from our heart. As long as we continue to hold grudges against others, as long as we seek to try and get revenge against others who have harmed us, we are going to live in the world of Lamech and the kingdom of this world. And we are going to suffer by our own tortures. It is only when we can follow the example set by our Heavenly Father and forgive others and start with just forcing ourselves to say, I forgive you, and then allowing God's love and joy to fill our hearts and, and free us from our bitterness that we are able to live in the kingdom of heaven and enjoy the, the world and the life that God has for us. Amen. So at this time, we come before the Lord in prayer. And the church we are praying for this week is Westminster Presbyterian Church in Mifflin Town and the Reverend Nancy McClure. Let us give thanks and pray for the members of the congregation, their elders, deacons, and pastor, that they may be encouraged and strengthened in their witness to the gospel. So this week, please be praying for Westminster Presbyterian Church. And let's look at our VIP list here. Uh, so Friday, Banks and Irma from the McCoysville congregation are having an anniversary. And Friday, Dana is having a birthday. Saturday is Anne's uh, birthday and Michaela. So uh, are there any other birthdays or anniversaries that we know of? 
Okay. Well, um, the organ is going to play happy birthday for us, and I invite you to uh, sign along with us. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we won't name specific names uh, here in church for prayer concerns, but if you are watching us at home and you have any prayer concerns, uh, use Facebook Messenger or uh, text me, and we will uh, share those prayer concerns uh, after uh, worship. So as we come before the Lord in prayer, uh, each of our petitions ends, Lord, in your mercy... I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Seeking the renewal of the Holy Spirit in our communities and in our world, we pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Merciful God, bind the body of Christ with the spirit of forgiveness. Shape us to be bearers of mercy and justice in this world, and teach us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us to exercise justice for your creation. Move us to be good stewards of all you've made and make us examples of how we care for every living thing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Generous God, we pray for the nations of the world that those who have much and have enjoyed your abundance will share that wealth with those in need, practicing compassion for all victims of ex economic exploitation. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Send your healing presence to the lonely, afflicted, and anxious. Surround those who suffer with caring people and give peace to all who are troubled, especially those we lift before you in the silence of our hearts. Reveal your mercy in times of crisis through the work of police officers, firefighters, emergency medical technicians, and all first responders. Give hope to those who have lost loved ones in emergencies. Today, we remember especially those who have lost their homes and property to the fires that rage on the West Coast, and we ask you to comfort those who lo whose loved ones have died. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we give thanks for all the saints whose lives point to Christ crucified, turn our own eyes to the cross where we find holy justice, mercy, compassion, and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, even as the painful memories of 9-11 are seared into our hearts, we yet hold fast to the hope that even now springs forth from the ashes. We pray for those still suffering from loss or injury as a result of the tragic events of that day. Let us never forget those who risked or lost their lives to save others. Their sacrifices and love represent the best in humanity and the path to which Christ still calls each of us. As we continue to mourn those who died, may we honor them by being loving neighbors to all and by building a lasting peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, holy God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who also taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And uh, now let's meditate on a couple of verses from the hymn Amazing Grace. Postlude music. invite you to stand for the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit descend upon you all and be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all this week. Amen.